This is the Noon News from Montana's News Leader. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Asia Gore. Our top story this half hour, the Centers for Disease Control reports that more than 140 Americans die from opioid abuse every single day. This afternoon, President Trump is taking steps to try to reduce that number. CBS's Mola Lange has more. President Trump is expected to declare a public health emergency on opioids at the White House this afternoon. We're going to be doing, we're going to be doing a very, very important meeting uh, sometime in the very short, very near future on opioids. The administration's goal is to reduce addiction to prescription pain medication and illicit drugs like heroin and fentanyl. Given the scale of this epidemic with millions of Americans already affected, prevention is not enough. We must also help those who are suffering from addiction by expanding access to life-saving treatment. Today's declaration gives states the ability to shift funds away from other medical issues such as HIV, diabetes and maternal care to provide more opioid treatments. The president's action stops short of declaring a national emergency to deal with the crisis, something he promised several times to do, even as recently as last week. It's a very important step. And to get to that step, a lot of work has to be done, and it's time-consuming work. We're going to be doing it next week. No additional funding will be given to deal with the crisis, but the administration says it is working with Congress to add money to the end-of-the-year budget. Along with my colleagues, I stand ready to work with him on future proposals to provide necessary tools to protect our communities from this scourge. The president backed an additional $45 billion to combat the opioid epidemic as part of the GOP plan to repeal and replace Obamacare, but Republican infighting killed the bill. Mola Lange, CBS News, the White House. By law, a public health emergency can only last for 90 days, but it can be renewed any number of times for as long as necessary. Here in Montana, a Busby woman will spend less than a decade behind bars for a drunk driving crash that killed two young boys last year. 24-year-old Tiana Littleson was sentenced in U.S. District Court in Billings to six years in prison on two counts of involuntary manslaughter and assault. Littleson's blood alcohol content was more than four times the legal driving limit when she got behind the wheel. Driving at 80 miles per hour, Littleson crashed into a stopped vehicle on Highway 212 containing four children. 14-year-olds Stephen Bertram and James Walker died in the crash, and another child was seriously injured. Defense attorneys say Little Son became a heavy drinker to cope with the loss of her boyfriend, who died in a drunk driving crash. A man is dead and two others hospitalized after a rollover crash south of Hardin. It happened Wednesday afternoon on the Crow Indian Reservation. Montana Highway Patrol reports a Chevy sports utility vehicle was driving too fast on a gravel road. The vehicle left the roadway and rolled multiple times, causing two people to be ejected. One of the people ejected, a man, was killed. MHP believes he was the driver. A man and a woman were hospitalized and were told the woman is in poor health. The incident remains under investigation. Meanwhile, a fatal crash in Lake County is under investigation today. One man was killed in the two-vehicle crash just outside R. Lee on Highway 93 Wednesday afternoon. MHP reports the northbound male driver of a Subaru veered into the southbound lane and struck an oncoming truck. The driver of the Subaru was killed and the driver of the truck hospitalized with unknown injuries. Drugs and alcohol are not considered factors, though it's unclear why the driver of the Subaru left his lane. The investigation is ongoing. And an investigation is underway after what Missoula authorities call a violent and racist post on social media by a Frenchtown High School student. The Facebook post was made Wednesday. The Missoula County Attorney's Office is now working to determine what, if any, charges are appropriate. The sheriff's office calls the post troublesome, but will not release any further details about what was posted. The school says it is taking the matter seriously. A Montana couple in Oregon for a gem and mineral show had between $300,000 and a half a million dollars in gems stolen from their car. The couple, who owns Montana Gems in Columbus, specializes in Yogo Sapphires. They were attending the Portland Regional Gem and Mineral Show a couple of weeks ago, and they left the show to go to a nearby McDonald's. While they were inside, the gems were stolen from their vehicle. Owner Randy Knighting believes the thief scouted them at the show because they knew exactly where to find the, in the vehicle to find those gems. Here in Billings, fire crews battling flames and wind last night as a fire burned through a barn, killing two horses south of the I-90 frontage road. This map shows the general location of that fire burning between I-90 and the Yellowstone River. The Billings Motorcycle Club Hill climb site is across the river just to the east. 
As of this morning, the fire was still burning and is 30% contained as Billings Fire Department and DNRC crews worked through the night. The fire consumed two outbuildings and approximately five to seven acres of wildland. The fire was difficult to extinguish due to windy conditions. Authorities are in the process of conducting the fire or finding the fire origin and cause investigation. An update on the investigation will be released later today. Montana's 2017 fire season appears to be the most expensive in state history. Nearly 1.3 million acres burned across the state. The Legislative Fiscal Division estimates it cost the state $74.2 million. State leaders budgeted $32 million and the governor's emergency fund covered another $12.5 million. That's a shortfall of $29 million for fiscal year 2018 alone. That leaves no fire funds to cover next year. Turning now to the weather scene, we check in with Ed McIntosh. We know fire season's not over, but how's the temperature doing today? You know, drastically different than we were just 24 hours ago. As we take a look, yesterday's highs were anywhere from the upper 50s to the low 80s. Tied records yesterday in Jordan, Miles City, and Sheridan, Wyoming. Billings actually broke the record by one degree compared to the October 25th record set in 1977. But look how much cooler today. East of the Continental Divide, as much as 44 degrees colder right now. Now than it was at noon yesterday in Lewistown, Jordan, Billings, all the way down into Cody, Wyoming, looking at temperatures drastically colder. And even though it's a little bit warmer in western Montana, we've also had some very strong wind gusts across the region. We'll talk more about that wind and what's in store heading to the weekend in a couple of moments. Thanks, Ed. We'll take a closer look. A former Bozeman legislator is entering the race for Montana's lone U.S. House seat. Former State Representative Kathleen Williams, who declined to run again in 2016 after serving three terms, announced her bid today for Congress. Williams, a Democrat, says she can bring unity to a polarized Capitol Hill. Williams says she's championed building and diversifying Montana's economy. She becomes the fifth Democrat to announce plans to seek the Democratic nomination. Questions persist into how a small whitefish energy company won a $300 million no-bid contract to help restore electricity to Puerto Rico. CBS's Nikki Batiste has more. The mayor of San Juan, Puerto Rico is engaged in a Twitter battle with the company that was awarded a no-bid $300 million contract to help rebuild the island's power grid. Carmen Yulin Cruz, in an interview with Yahoo News Tuesday evening, said she thinks the deal with Whitefish Energy should be voided. Whitefish is two years old, has two full-time employees, and a handful of ties to the Trump administration. Cruz described the company as inadequate and said the contract lacks due diligence. Whitefish shot back with a threat to leave, writing, We've got 44 linemen rebuilding power lines in your city, and 40 more men just arrived. Do you want us to send them back or keep working? The company later apologized. Lawmakers, though, are eager to know how Whitefish got the job in the first place. My biggest concern is we don't have enough information as to the process that went through that. Politicians on Capitol Hill from both sides of the aisle are now calling for an investigation into the Whitefish contract. Nikki Batiste, CBS News. Whitefish insists a main reason it won the deal is because it was willing to accept much less money up front than its competitors. The Bozeman Chamber of Commerce agrees with a proposed fee increase at 17 national parks, including Yellowstone. That proposal would hike entrance fees from $30 to $70 from May to September starting next year. The Chamber says the increase would create a better experience at the park because it would help with overcrowding. So to me, it's kind of like a double-edged sword. Um, you know, yes, you're limiting the number of people maybe that will be coming to visit, but are we giving those people a lot better experience when they're here and that they stay longer? The Chamber of Commerce is also working with hotels and resorts to market cheaper winter rates to increase visitation during the less popular months. Still ahead on the new news, if you plan to leave the country anytime soon, returning to the U.S. might take a little longer than usual. Details on new security checks next. But first, Ed has our weather forecast. Stay with us. You're watching MTN News with Asia Gore, Storm Trekker Weather with Ed McIntosh, and Farm and Ranch News.